I'm going to ask you to stand for the judge and to stand for the jury because this is a very important case and I don't want presentation to eclipse substance. Um, we'll be standing for you, and we'll stand, we'll stand. I'll stand for all of those, but I'll be standing for you. Okay, when they ask you to stand for them, stand for me, then. Thank you. Uh, other than that, I ask that there be nothing disruptive in the courtroom. Anything that causes a delay, that wastes the jury's time, is going to detract from their consideration of the issues and move their focus to the logistics. And we don't want that. We want their minds firmly on the so, issues. No paper hats? No paper hats. Uh, just no bullshit, guys, please. Got it. Um, and other than that, thank you so much for, for coming out. This makes me feel a lot better, you know, to have people standing behind me. It makes all the difference. And You deserve uh, it, Rich. You're doing a lot today. Thanks, man. Let's win this thing. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Take it off. Can we maybe get the court employees uh, to give up seats in the public? No. Sure, but she, she's talking. She's not talking to me like a person right now. Yeah. I, I'd Matt's be happy to talk to Rich. Well, that's a lot nicer way to do it. I know, but he's already asked you sure, Tebow's assaulted me before, so I don't really care what Tebow thinks. So he can just do his own thing. But I'm going to do what I can for Rich. Well, what you can do. Okay. Listen, but you don't have to talk to me like I'm a piece of your property because I'm not. I'm not talking to you. Like you did. You said take your head off. Take your head off. I'm not a piece of your property. You didn't say please. You didn't inform me that your client had requested that. Those are ways to communicate with people. Two more seats available. Excuse me, I was already having a conversation about that. Don't worry about it. Uh, well, this is like keeping my hair down. It's not really like a hat. Wow. That's really silly. Bandana. It's a do rag. All right, good. Morning, please be seated.
understand that? Mm -hmm. uh,
Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, please raise your right hands. Keep them raised during the oath and at the conclusion, please signify your assent by saying, I will. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will carefully consider the evidence and the law presented to you in this case and that you will deliver a fair and true verdict as to the charges against the defendant? So I hope you got it. I will. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You may be seated. Mr. Paul, please remain standing. Everyone have a good evening.
same date, April 27, 2012, the next charge is sale of what is represented to be active or LSD. Um, that took place at the same time as the sale of marijuana. Also, to Mr. Dupont, they cooperated with the business. Yeah, they also took them to um, The last charge, I mean, the, uh, the next charge is May 16, 2012, also in this charge allegedly she sold marijuana to another person, also more than an ounce. Again, you'll see from the evidence that this is uh, she sold marijuana to the cooperating individual, Mr. Uh, finally, on May 30th, 2012, she's alleged to have possessed marijuana with the intent to sell it. Um, and that, that's the final term of charge here, also, again, more than an ounce. Those are the charges. Uh, we're going to hear from a number of witnesses for, for the state. Uh, among those witnesses are the following people. We're going to hear from Cooper Charles Newton, who's now with the New Hampshire State Police, formerly he was with the Attorney General uh, of Task Force. For the first two dates, you will learn from uh, then Detective Newton, now Cooper Newton. For the first two dates, so April 17, 2012, April 27, He's the lead uh, investigator for the DTF. So he will explain to you uh, the investigation on those first two dates and how uh, the cooperating individual came to be working for the DTF, cooperating with them. Uh, he will explain to you that uh, after the sale that happened between the defendant and the cooperating individual, that cooperating individual, who I would just call P.I., we call him P.I., the ordinance of Newport, turned the marijuana over to Super uh, Newton. He took it, he packaged it, you'll hear about that. It gets secured, sent to the state lab. At the state lab, it gets analyzed. Um, we're going to hear from a couple of lab analysts, two of because there were two involved in this case. They analyzed all the drug evidence, and they will explain to you that the marijuana was in fact marijuana, that it was more than one, um, and that the purported or, or LSD or acid is in fact uh, a chemical similar to LSD but not LSD. Um, so after Trooper Newton testifies, you're also going to hear from uh, Jim Moore. He took over the Actually, one of the in this case, 
who was involved in the investigation, an FBI agent. Um, we're going to learn that there was some um, equipment that they had on the CI, a video device, an audio device that enabled uh, the CI to carry it from the field and go to the transaction site and actually have audio of it and video of it. So um, you will learn that that equipment was set up on the produce on the CI prior to the deal at the same time when the car and it didn't And then he waves it to the field um, And when he goes back to turn over the drugs, they get the equipment and they have a report. Now this is not television, so there are not like 10, 10 tapes. So uh, this is real life. So the video, sometimes all you're going to see is the sky and you know, the trees and nothing, nothing terribly fascinating. Um, it is, there is video, there is audio, okay? And that is true of the first three incidents even here. Um, the April 27th event, the learn from the witnesses, took place again in team, this time at the You'll hear from the witnesses. He's already been through the process. 
of meeting at another place with the DPS, getting searched, searched his car, gave him the money, took up the wire, sent him off. They follow him. The DPS officers will follow him, make sure he doesn't go off course. Uh, he stops right here in front of Tony Clamato. Um, this too is on video. Again, it's not television. The video is not fantastic, but it's on video, audio. The defendant uh, gets in the car with the CI. They drive off. They drive around the block. During that drive, uh, the CI gives the defendant the money. They have some conversation. Uh, the defendant gives the CI Mr. Dupont the drugs, which is marijuana, more than an ounce. Um, CI Mr. Dupont, after the deal, drops off the defendant. Uh, on the side of the road, uh, gets out, and CI drives to the prearranged meeting location where he meets with the DTF, who has been, as I said, conducting surveillance, so they're actually following him. They meet at that place, same routine. They take the drugs from Mr. DuPont. They take the audio video equipment off Mr. DuPont so we can have a copy. Um, they search him again, and that's the end of the May, May 16th. As I said, all of that goes ends up going to the lab to get tested, and it's shown to be marijuana, and uh, the represented acid. Um, the last uh, event is May 30th, 2012, also in Keene. Now, by this time, <coughs> there's an arrest warrant for the defendant for the previous uh, sale that I just described. So now they're looking for him just to arrest him. Uh, and they want to figure out how to get him to the place where they can arrest him. So um, they set up another deal using Mr. DuPont, uh, trying to call the defendant. Finally, talk to the defendant. The defendant agrees to sell more marijuana to Mr. DuPont. Again, this is May 30th, 2012. They agree on, on a meeting place, which, uh, if I recall correctly, is by CDS, again here in Keene. Now, this time, the police are only going to arrest the defendant. So, the deal doesn't actually happen. The defendant just has agreed on the phone to sell him an to the CI. And then the defendant goes to the place where the deal is supposed to take place. And there, instead of Mr. DuPont, are members of the Keene Police Department. Uh, you're going to hear from Lieutenant James McLaughlin of the Keene Police Department. And uh, you may hear from... Uh, Detective Mike Goodchild, Officer Mike Goodchild from the Union Police Department. They were there when the defendant showed up. They arrested the defendant on the warrant. Uh, the defendant had it on him, in his hand, as I recall, a bag. Lo and behold, in the bag is more marijuana, not surprisingly, since he's just set up the deal. Um, that is seized by Lieutenant McLaughlin of the Union Police Department. He uh, takes control of it. He gives it to Lieutenant Mayers, who I told you about, Jim Mayers from the DPF, who was also involved in this case, conducting surveillance. Remember, Jim Mayers took over the investigation halfway through when Charlie Hinton went to the police. So McLaughlin gives the drugs to Mayers, Lieutenant Mayers, who is now in charge of the investigation. Mayers <laughs> secures it, labels it, it's transported to the lab eventually, it too is tested. Not surprisingly, it is also found to be, uh, by the analyst, marijuana in an amount more than an ounce. Uh, those are the facts as you will hear them from the uh, state witnesses. Yeah. <coughs> the law you learn from the judge, okay? Um, and so I'm not going to attempt, he's going to give you instructions at the end of the case. His instructions control, not any summary I give you. I will just say that uh, it is a crime to sell a controlled drug, in this case marijuana. Uh, the amount, the amount is thrown in there um, just because amounts vary um, and the statute addresses what that means in different amounts. So that, that's why the amount is in there. Uh, but you know, it's unlawful to sell marijuana. Uh, that's the bottom line. And, and to be so um, 
It's also unlawful, perhaps maybe surprisingly, um, to sell something that you represent to be a control drug. So uh, saying to someone that you're selling acid to them, uh, for example. Even if it turns out it's not LSD, uh, that's still a crime. Selling a substance you represent to be a control drug. Um, that's the law in a nutshell. There's a lot more to it. It's the state's burden, I will say, to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant has no burden. It's the state's burden. I have to prove, or the state has to prove the entire case, the elements of the crimes, beyond a reasonable doubt. And much more to the law, which the judge will explain to you. Um, at the end of the case, the state expects that all the evidence will show you, beyond a reasonable doubt,
to record every word of Rich Paul's mouth, to make these videos, to make sure everything was down, except when they were recording their own voices. The one conversation that's not recorded in this whole event is the conversation where Philip Christiana interrogates Mr. Paul and asks him to wear a wire into the King after the plan. That doesn't get recorded. You have the power to judge the facts and the law. You have the power to decide whether the law as you hear it should apply in this case. And you have the power to determine what is a just and fair verdict. And then this trial is over. I'll be able to speak to you again. And on behalf of Mr. Paul, I'll ask you to return a just and fair verdict in this case. And that verdict is not before. Thank you. State can call the first witness. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. State calls Trooper Charles Wolf. Oh, yes. 
Yeah, we don't use people that have uh, pending DWI charges or you know, violent felonies to crime against people situations like that. All right, I want to draw your attention to um, the first date in this case, April 17, 2012. What person, if any, was cooperating with the New Hampshire Drug Task Force to assist the task force in connection with an investigation into uh, Richard Paul? Uh, the individual that was cooperating with the task force was a Richard Dumont. Okay, Dumont. Dumont. And could you uh, just explain why was Mr. Dupont assisting, just briefly, why was Mr. Dupont assisting the DPF? He was looking at gaining favorable consideration on the pending drug task force case that was developed against him. Alright, so he had some charges pending, is that right? He did. Alright. Now, with respect to April 17, 2012, um, what, if any, pre-authorization did you obtain prior to recording the uh, <coughs> drug transaction on April 17, 2012? We obtained the one-party authorization through the Attorney General's office. Just briefly explain, um, what does that mean? Why do you have to do that? We have to do that in the state of New Hampshire. When you want to record someone without them knowing, uh, both parties have to be made aware of the situation. Uh, in our case, we get what's called a one-party authorization, where we there's certain crimes in the state of New Hampshire that if you get permission to record the conversation, then it's authorized by the state of New Hampshire, either through the county attorney or the attorney general's office. And in this case, from uh, from where did you get the authorization? We get it through the attorney general's office. Now, what um, other agency, if any, was involved also in this investigation April 17, 2012? We received assistance from the Federal Bureau of Investigation as well as the Department. And with respect, with respect to April 17, 2012, what was the role of the uh, FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation? What, what did they do? Their role was to assist us with surveillance as well as they provide us with the equipment that we use to document the transaction. Okay. So the hidden camera and audio was the FBI? Yes. Uh, where, if anywhere, prior to the transaction between DuPont and the defendant on April 17, 2012, where did you meet Mr. DuPont ahead of time? We met him at the Phoenix Police Department. And what was the purpose of that meeting? The purpose of that meeting was to facilitate the transaction that we had planned for that day, um, as well as to meet the informant for the first time. <coughs> Then searched the vehicle. Then searched, and off he goes. What are you all doing 
I'll be driving along then. We, when we do a buy, uh, we follow the person, the informant, or the undercover, depending on who's doing the buy, from the point of where we have our meeting initially to the point of the transaction. You can't put that up there. And then after the transaction, we follow the person or the undercover back and this is a predetermined meeting location. All right, uh, and in this case, did you, in fact, you and other members of the surveillance team follow the CI, Mr. DuPont, from the meeting place to uh, the location of the anticipated buy? I did. Okay. <coughs> so you were watching him as he drove to Walgreens? Yes. All right. And where did you uh, situate yourself for surveillance purposes at the area of Walgreens? I was inside the vehicle with one of the FBI agents, and we were parked in, I don't know if you're familiar, but the Walgreens parking lot. Um, you have the pizza pie, and you have Walgreens. I was over more so in the front where the old Sears was, out closer to West Street, watching the, that side of it. Okay. So, did you have eyes on DuPont in his car? Yes. And who, if anyone, came up to DuPont's car and made contact with Mr. DuPont. Mr. Paul. Right. And um, this person here is a Um, the FBI takes possession of their 
uh, audio recording equipment. The informant provided me with the, the marijuana that he had purchased from Mr. Paul, as well as the points left over that I put in. I believe it was $30. It was some change? Yes. Okay. Do you remember what the amount was you gave him? $450. Okay. And the purchase price from the marijuana ended up being $420. Uh, so he gave you the change. <coughs> Mr. DuPont gave you the marijuana, did you say? All right. So now you've got the marijuana. The, the FBI, did they get the recording device off of Mr. DuPont? Did you ultimately get a copy of that from the FBI? No, they did All right. What did you do with the marijuana that, uh, or the apparent marijuana that uh, Mr. Dupont, the CI, gave to you on that day we were facing? When we, when we get evidence from the case, we have procedures, we have to fill out an evidence examination form, the DSS-220 form. Basically, it, it documents the, the defendant's name, our contact information, and then when we have a piece of evidence, we give it an exhibit number. And at the bottom of the form is the chain of custody. And basically, the chain of custody just documents who has possession of the evidence. And ultimately, all evidence is packaged, logged, and transferred down to the state plan for laboratory for analysis. So, um, you described you package it up and you do some kind of label uh, of it or what? All right. And then you fill out some form uh, that you describe.
Um, Your Honor, I have here a uh, one page document that's marked 2A. I'd like to have it marked as 2A for identification purposes. Super Newton, I'm showing you a single page document that's marked uh, as 2A for identification. Do you recognize that? What is it? Yes, sir. All right. How much was it this time? 
about four hundred and fifty dollars. He's given the money, he's hooked up with the wire, the video by the FBI, um, original search, he searched, he said, then what happened? Uh, we basically put the, the deal into motion. Um, let, me, let me stop you there and ask you this. Prior to putting the deal in motion, as with last time, what if any pre authorization did you obtain in order to record the pre authorization? Where was the deal to take place on this day, April 27, 2012? We believe this is going to be over uh, near the Walgreens and that area again with Mr. Paul. All right. Uh, but as it turned out, it was at a different location. Can you explain how that change came about? Uh, the informant made a phone call uh, to Mr. Paul and they decided that. Hey, Jack, keep your thing. into this, you said, you testified that you thought it was going to be a Walgreens, turns out it ended up being somewhere else, is that correct? That's true. Right. Um, and where was that somewhere else? Not, not based on what somebody told you, but just based on uh, what you saw later. At the, I believe it's called the Keen Pen now, it's more common than the Valley Green on West Street. How far away is that from Walgreens, by the way? Last night. After you let the CI go from that pre-arranged meeting place, you have set the wire up the money. Yes, sir. Is it the, was it the same way it was last time? Was he driving his own vehicle? Or? He was. He was his own vehicle. And as a matter of policy, he followed the person from the predetermined meeting location to the point of view. And, um, On this particular call, or this particular deal, uh, what if any access do you, did you have to live feed sound in other words, the audio? I have the ability on, on this purchase to actually listen to the, the wire that the informant was wearing uh, live time. Okay. And um, so <coughs> he's releasing his car. Where does he drive to? He drives to the Valley Green Keenan uh, Motel on uh -huh. West Street. Uh -huh. And you followed him and watched that? I followed him until the point that he entered the parking lot. And at that point, other people that I was working with took up a position watching him. So Where did you go during those things? I went and parked behind um, the Valley Green Motel. Um, 
crossing area that I felt uh, Mr. Paul's apartment would be. I was running parked up behind it. So the reason we did that is I just wanted to have a, a more clear uh, reception of the light train center. Um, so you're out of sight. What did you hear over the wire? Identification with the court's permission, I'd like to play the beginning. See if the witness who, who testified that he heard this.
your news now. I want you to listen to the audio that uh, you heard on that day. And tell me you can this is Special Agent Phil Christiana, and the Task Force Officer John Bishop. Today is April 17, 2012, and it's approximately 17 p.m. I'm going to be doing a conventional recording with the Rich Hall at Walgreens in King, New Hampshire, related to file number 281 RBS1045. Recognize the recording? That's the recording from the first part of the video. April 17, 2012? Yes. Accurate recording of the events of that day? I obviously haven't seen it in entirety, but that's based on my memory, I guess. That's the day. Permission to strike the ID when the answer is the full exhibit. No objection. Now, Pause that for a moment. You testified that you positioned yourself outside and you heard what happened on this day. Uh, and could you hear the defendant in that um, during the, the mm -hmm. events inside the hotel?
uh, who's part of the, the jury, uh, uh, not part of the jury, rather, but watching the trial proceedings. If you speak while proceedings are going on, you will be ordered to be removed from the courtroom and you will not be able to re-enter the courtroom during these proceedings. And uh, I made myself very clear, uh, and, if, and if you uh, have, any, have any doubts about my meaning, speak again, and you will see, because you will not be allowed back in during the course of this trial. Understood? Thank you.
why do you say acid or LSD? What, what's the understanding of the meaning of acid on the street? Like a hallucinogenic uh, psychedelic type drug. But when someone uses the term acid, what do you mean? What's that another word for? LSD. Okay. Um, the, uh, you could hear when the conversation ended, is that correct? Yes. All right. And did they, so they talked about, you could hear the marijuana sale between DuPont and the defendant? You could hear the conversations about the sale. About the sale. Same thing about the acid? Yes. All right. After the CI leaves the room, what happens? The co-workers who are on the other side of the, uh, the motel kept a good deal.
logged into our secure evidence facility, having transport down to the state line for analysis. And did you use the same type of form that you testified about previously? Yes. Before we go to that, I'm showing you what's marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit 3B. Do you recognize what that is? I do. Now, uh, how can you recognize that? Who, who's writing it on the program? Once again, it's my name. All right, so what is it? It is the uh, same case number as here, same date and time as the defendant. So I just went for this one, which is the second exhibit on this case.
Permission to play State's Exhibit 6 for the witness. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm going to take a few about that. I thought Exhibit 6 was the number of the invitation to the Let's take them out of order. Good, good question. April 17, 2012, you just testified you hooked up the uh, co cooperating individual, confidential informant. What was your term? Confidential informant. Newman Short. That was Mr. DuPont, is that correct? Correct. You had some, like, almost code name for him. What was that? Um, you called me a at the end of the 17th, after the transaction, was the goal, um, to recover the device, and then we do a post on it, basically saying that the, that the um, recording was done. Um, Christiana, if you can just raise your voice, uh, if your, your voice is present, the, the microphone uh, does not amplify, it just records okay. the sound. Uh, so in the end, if you guys are going to cost the defense counsel, we're having a hard time hearing you. Your voice was trailing off. You just <coughs> to up. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. You recovered after the transaction. Recovered the equipment from Mr. Newcomer. Is that correct? Correct. And that was on April 17, 2012. Uh, what were you doing during the transaction? Um, during the transaction, um, I was part of basically part of the surveillance team, um, which, which assisted in um, witnessing the. Transaction itself. Um, so I did witness um, part of that transaction, um, um, part of that meeting, and events after that meeting. That's part of my duty. Alright, so for, with respect to April 17th, 2012, you say you witnessed part of the transaction. Um, did you see who Mr. DuPont met with? I did. Uh, are you able to identify that person? I am. Is he in the courtroom today? Yes. You put him out for the jury in the court. Richard Paul. May the record reflect the witness identified the defendant. Record must have reflected. Just uh, describe what you saw occurred between Mr. DuPont, Dr. D, and the defendant. Paul. Um, I saw Mr. Paul approach Mr. DuPont's vehicle in the Walgreens. Um, so I entered the vehicle. Um, I saw the vehicle move from the Walgreens down West Street uh, to a gas station. Um, and then I saw him, you know, later saw Mr. Paul cross West Street um, and head towards the Phoenix. On foot or in a car? On foot. We uh, are going to come back to the recording. We're going to jump ahead to April 27, 2012. Um, what was your role, if any, in Keene on that day with respect to Mr. Paul? It was very similar. Um, I basically um, met with Mr. DuPont prior to placed the recording device on his person. After doing the preamble, sent him on his way. Um, then we um, did the surveillance <coughs> day off, you know, trying to cover as much of the transaction that day, Mr. DuPont had a transmitter on. So I was able to hear from my vehicle the entire meeting, most of the meeting, the vast majority of the meeting. So I positioned myself, um, we have positioned ourselves in my vehicle um, behind the key here. Is that where the, is that where the trans transaction took place? Yeah. Uh, you position yourself behind the scene in and you listen to most of the, uh, or you listen to the entire transaction you said, all right? Yeah. You know, we're able to listen to that majority of the song that would cut out of the radio and that majority of what was able to be, to be heard. Thank you. Now, the state asks permission to play to the sit for the witness. Any objections? No. Just any place. This is uh, Special Agent Phil Christiana. Today's date is April 27th, 2012. It's approximately 2.35 p.m. 
DHS soccer team is going to conduct a consensual um, recording with Rich Paul. Um, this is related to investigation 281 on BS 104-582.
You're asking the same question in a different way. It's still a leading question. It's not where. Well, part of the question is sustained. Where did Mr. DuPont go from this location until he arrived somewhere? He traveled from that location directly to the Keenan. And when, if at all, did he get out of his car during that trip? After he, he arrived at the Keenan. You had him under surveillance that whole trip? He was under surveillance.
happy <laughs> to uh, stay around and meet with mutual friends. Yeah, it's just a happy moment. Yeah, it's very well set up. But I will see you Sunday. Oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, I had a couple of festivals like last year. It was very cool. Yeah, it was very, 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 how much does it cost nowadays? Well, okay. it was uh, good. If you wanted, if you found something in that area on Craigslist, I'd be glad. 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 i
especially if it's the other hand, it's uh, they dated uh, April 27, 
up a little bit. Um, <coughs> we heard you on direct uh, talk about your involvement in um, your investigation involving Mr. Paul, correct? Correct. Okay. You set up, you were in charge of setting up the surveillance equipment on the um, confidential informant who's no longer confidential with the client. Correct. Okay. If you refer to him as with a code name Socrates, correct? Correct. That's the name you gave him. Correct. Right. Um, and you also refer at the beginning of the um, reporting to an FBI case number. Correct. Is that accurate? Um, and that that's that's the FBI case number. The case number you refer to to a R V S uh, the right number one zero four five eight two. That's, that's our number. Is that right? Yes. That's your number. Um, so that's your investigation number. That is not the Joint Task Force investigation. Correct. So you had a separate investigation happening at this time. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, which came first? Your investigation or the ETF investigation? It's um, more or less simultaneous. The way it works is that. Well, I shouldn't, shouldn't say that. I don't know when the when the Attorney General's Drug Task Force investigation actually commenced. Did you contact them or did they contact you? They contacted me. So you already had an open investigation. Correct. No. no All right, so we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna do a little bit of chicken and the egg thing. <laughs> so they're simultaneous or or one thing no, before the other? No, actually I'll I'll I am going to stage myself. Uh, my investigation was open at, at the request of the attorney, the attorney general of the task My yeah. assistance was requested, and as a result, I opened up the matter in order to provide them that assistance. So in order for them to do that, there has to be some kind of, there's a, there's a memorandum of agreement between the FBI, as far as the your Objection, permission, or code?
Um, are you aware whether there is a cooperation agreement between the FBI and the North Carolina Task Force and the city and I am aware that there is an agreement between the FBI and the New Hampshire Police. Okay, so the New Hampshire State Police as an agency of the state of New Hampshire, there is an agreement. Yeah. And is that uh, agreement entitled something like a cooperation agreement or a memorandum of agreement? I believe it's a memorandum. MO, memorandum of understanding. Yes. Okay. Are you familiar with that agreement? Not in detail. Well, you work for this for this agency, right? <coughs> and you participated in a joint investigation with the state agency. Is that right? That's correct. One has nothing to do with the other. Right. Um, the MOU is between us and the state police is for them to participate on our task force. This investigation has nothing to do with them. Um, I can elaborate on that. This, this is an extra duty. Well, I get a request from a state or local agency. One of my duties is to provide uh, local and state agencies with investigative assistance. And that's what I did in this matter. I was requested assistance, and I provided it. It had nothing to do with joint territory task force. Who requested it? The New Hampshire uh, Attorney General Drug Task Force. Who from the Drug Task Force requested your services? I can't name one person. There are several people that um, I think mm -hmm. I said the one person that I recall discussing it with was um, Officer Newton. Right, so at some point, in time, Officer Newton called on the phone. Is that how it happened? No, this is a person. Yeah, she was in. more than uh, just you involved 
um, and come into the involvement of the investigation. Is that accurate? There's no other more agents involved in it? <coughs> there was a task force officer. <coughs> and was there another FBI agent involved? Um, actually, at one point there was. Yeah. Right. So there were at one there were, there was you and agent I can't pronounce the name Cap Captain Lobo. Is that correct? might have been involved. Uh, I'm, I remember more clearly uh, an agent named Brandon Galloway. All right. It, well, well, there's a woman standing in the video. Do you remember you really looking at that, that woman in the video? I'm not going to look at it again. It, 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 it probably was Agent Capo de Luco. Capo de Luco? Is that correct? Okay. So it was you and Agent Capo de Luco and Agent Galloway? And at one point, yes, ma'am. And what about with the bishop? The bishop? Yeah, yeah, he's a state trooper. He's a test of office. Okay. He's not FBI? No, state trooper. All right. So there are three... Um, FBI involved at any given time. Correct. Um, so when you came with your uh, surveillance equipment, I mean, is it, is it is the common practice for you are you required to open your own pay file? Yeah, when we get these, these requests, we obviously, um, I have to make sure that um, it's a request that we can fulfill and that we should fulfill it. And then in order to provide the assistance, we have to open up some some sort of kind of formal matter, an investigation or a document that is okay. And how do you decide whether or not you should go ahead? I discuss with my supervisor. Is there some kind of protocol you have to follow? Discussing with my supervisor. Other than discussing with your supervisor, what is it? Are you able to describe what? It was very simple. I mean, that, uh, you know, my direct supervisor. He has to be aware that we get these requests and essentially we approve the requests or not. Mm -hmm. And is there, again, are there any criteria for these people that you're aware of? Um, there's no specific criteria. I mean, obviously it has to be a legal request. Um, you know, it has to be in an area that we have an expertise in. It's, it's more along those lines. Um, and if it's, if, if it's and if we have the manpower to provide that. Do you remember what the date was when we heard from Officer No, sometime in March. In March? Of 2012. Okay. Either March or early April. Late March or early April. Um, Alright, so you come with your uh, surveillance equipment, correct? And we saw it as on the video um, you placing on the on Richard D. Hunt, correct? Um, are you, uh, in those preamble parts where you're on the camera and you can see one other person on the camera, are there any drug task force agents there at that point? There are. Okay. You don't talk about them, you just talk about yourself and you talk about Officer Bishop. But you don't name everyone else there. Um, that's correct, I didn't name everyone else there. Okay, so you named yourself and that's until you can name yourself and Officer Bishop or Bishop or however you put it in. So there are other people there. Absolutely. You just don't include them in the preamble. Correct. Why is that? Um, it's it's really just um, there's no real purpose. Uh, you know, that's just the way the moment is like it's two people kind of team up to do it to make sure it's done correctly. You know, he's there to check me, make sure I don't forget something, and that's the reason we just put the two names on. Uh, you're involved in this. I'm sorry to interrupt. I think we okay. need to close the window and hear voices outside. Right? 
and um, to the time that Mr. Paul was elected? Um, I was off and on. Not, I wasn't there for every event. Were you there for every event that involved a surveillance camera? No, ma'am. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so are there other surveillance videos that exist that don't, aren't, don't involve your camera? Don't involve me, correct. Okay. So you only use the camera on the 17th or 27th? Thirty. Another day. When uh, when the incident would be controlled by however you want to put it, you took custody of the camera and the recording equipment. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, and you took them back to your office. Yes. Okay. So when the agency that created these videos, not the drug task force. Um, I think that's fair to say. We, we conducted the recording, um, downloaded, downloaded the, uh, the meeting, and then provided it um, as it is. Uh, so you provide a copy of the recording to the drug task force? Correct. Right. And you retain a copy for yourself, I assume? Correct. Right. Um, Were you present when Mr. Paul was arrested? I was not at his arrest. Were you present after his arrest? I, I was. And, and where was that? At the King Police Department. Did you um, speak with him? I did. Was that recorded? It was not. Right, well, why wasn't that recorded? It's not our policy. Uh, I'm not allowed to record it. <coughs> You're not allowed to record it. Why is that? It's against our policy. What, what the policy? That we're not allowed to record it. Right, so the policy of what? Of the FBI? Is it not allowed to record interviews? That's true. Um, but you're allowed to record, I, I guess, you're allowed to record some kind of federal authorization, I assume. Say that again? Well, in this case, there had to be, you, I assume you understand that there had to be a, a uh, as been testified to, you, there had to be an authorization from the Attorney General's office in order to record, in order to make this recording. The Attorney General Drug Task Force had to get authorization on their side, and I get separate authorization to do it on, on their committee. So you can get authorization to make a recording? <laughs> That's correct. Okay. So you can. If you got authorization to make a recording of that conversation, you could have. Is that you could have gotten authorization or to record your interview with Mr. Paul? Um, I'm I might have been able to. Yeah. Okay. Did you attempt to do that? I did not. Okay. Then there would be a Is it good policy to record, or is it policy to ask to record? As a rule, we do not record interviews. I know that from my training. Why is that? There are exceptions. And what are the exceptions? Um, well, the policy's kind of changed over the years, all right? Or it's, it's, it's still evolving. <laughs> but as a general rule, we do not record any because I knew that to be the case. Um, and that's why the decision is made not to record any uh, All right, so the policy is evolving. Is it written down somewhere? I'm sure it is. Have you seen it? So, do you know the last time it evolved? When that was? I don't know when it was revised. Okay. So it's not. This isn't something that you get. I, I guess, and I'm not trying to trick you. I mean, this isn't something that you get a handbook for. And there's a you know, Directive 1.2A that says you shall not record it. I might have 20 years ago in my initial training, right. and that's where I take it from. That that rule. Okay. So that so. That might have been the rule 20 years ago. <coughs> it was the rule. It was the rule 20 years ago, absolutely. Right, but you're not aware of whether or not that actually is the rule now. I, I know it would still be the rule. Um, I know there are exceptions when we have recorded interviews, but as a general rule, we don't do that. And as a, to err on the side of <coughs> to be within the policy, um, one, you have to get approval to do it. Um, so you have to have the time <coughs> to do that. And two, I just knew that it was safer not to record it. Why was it safer not to record it? To avoid a possible violation of the policy I know to be in effect. 
Yeah, but you weren't alone in the room, correct? I was not. There was another officer there. Um, did he ask to record it? I remember having a conversation about it for you, and I brought up the issue of how it could be an issue for me, how it is an issue for me to record it. So it would be the point not to record it. So I'm just going to make sure I understand. Your understanding of the FBI policy is that you are not allowed to report it. There are exceptions to the rule. But there are exceptions to the rule. Correct. And what are the exceptions? I've never tried to exercise them. It's more of gaining approval and going through that approval process. That's one of the elements of it. So you obviously have to have the time to get that approval. That means I have to then reach out to my supervisor and maybe others. You don't always have the time to do that. And quite honestly, I wasn't interested in recording the interview. So I never went down that road. In general, we didn't record interviews. I didn't want to record the interview. I didn't seek the exception. Okay, because you didn't want to. Correct. Because you didn't want anyone to listen to it? No, ma'am. Okay, well, what did you talk to him about? Let me ask you this question. Did you take any notes during the interview? I honestly couldn't tell you off the top of my head. I don't recall making any notes. If I did, it would be in my file. Do you have your file with you? No, ma'am. All right, so you don't remember taking any notes? I do not. Or did you practice to take notes? That varies. Some interviews I take notes. Some interviews I do not. It's a conversation. And some people don't appreciate when you take notes. And that's the reason I believe I didn't take notes in this instance. Because Mr. Hall would probably have had a problem with that. And it would distract us from the conversation we were trying to have. Well, he was under arrest, right? He was under arrest. Okay, so did he tell you he had a problem with it? I never asked him. You thought he might, but you didn't ask him. I did not ask him. And you didn't ask him if he could report it? I did not ask him. And the officer that was present from the King Police to your knowledge did not ask him? That's correct. So, in other words, you pick and choose which conversations, interviews, interrogations, however you want to put it, that are recorded. Or recorded either verbally or recorded in writing. No, ma'am. I have never recorded an interview in my 21 years. You've taken notes, though, you just said. Absolutely. That's what I mean. I mean, I don't mean just recorded on audio tape or on a surreptitious video tape. I mean, have you ever made contemporaneous notes? Absolutely. Of interviews before? Yes. You did not do it this time? Not to my recollection. Okay, not to your recollection. You don't have your file, so you can't check. I can't tell you about that. And you said that your reasoning for that was that you thought that Mr. Paul might get mad at you or might be upset about it? No, that it would distract from the conversation we were trying to have. And what was that conversation about? We really didn't have much of a conversation. It was very short, actually. Mr. Paul cut it off. Okay. So what was the short part of the conversation about? I basically asked Mr. Paul if he was willing to cooperate. In what way? We never got into what that cooperation was. You asked if he was willing to cooperate in an investigation? Is that what you asked if he was willing to cooperate? That's correct. Okay, so you got that part, right? Yeah. What was the investigation about that you wanted to talk about? I never... Did you actually know?
ordinary, ordinarily you would not have the opportunity to listen in simply because um, like you would have to see I'm um, sure that, that if council wants to confer after the event conference, <coughs> maybe an opportunity to do that.